And now following with the program, I would love to introduce um, our next speaker, Dr. Nosti Moss. Dr. Nuno is a marine biologist with a particular interest in field studies in the coral reefs, coastal areas of the Gulf of Mexico and cenotes of the Yucatan Peninsula. He has worked on several projects, such as the Socotra Island Biodiversity Project, GEF, in Yemen, in several research projects in Mozambique, Venezuela, and Portugal. He currently works at the Multidisciplinary Unit for Teaching and Research of the Faculty of Science of the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Yucatan, Mexico, since 2002. Dr. Nuno, welcome. There we go. Thank well, thank you. you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I will talk in English. And uh, I was thinking on the title for this presentation, and I thought that this, this is it. The future uh, is already here, at least for a person like myself, which is over 40 and has seen uh, amazing things using some of the AI. So I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence on the detection and quantification of biodiversity and ecological projects, processes, but some other things as well. Uh, my presentation will focus on these three questions, why, how, and what. And uh, uh, let me just put this away a little bit. There we go. And uh, let's start. So why? Reasons for using AI for climate. I like to start the presentations with this quote that may be used uh, uh, by other people. Anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. The irony here is that the person that produced this quote is an economist, so there must be a message there. Um, a little bit of history so you understand. I was born in Mozambique. I'm the son of a marine biologist, and I've been in the field with my dad since I was a, a young, young person. I studied then marine biology in Lisbon, took my PhD in the UK, and now I work in Mexico in the coral reefs. And since the first days when I was in the Mozambican channel working with my dad, well, helping him, I realized that there was an imbalance. And as you can see in this image, uh, what this image is, is just uh, occurrences of species uh, worldwide on the Global Biodiversity Information Facility from the United Nations, there is a very strong uh, disequilibrium between the rich countries, which is like uh, you have like read more uh, observations uh, with the poor countries. But there is another interesting uh, pattern here is that we have much more information in land than on the sea. And there's many reasons for that. I'm not going into the detail. So the oceans cover 70% of our planet. They contribute to the significant part in the economic benefit that could be equivalent to the seventh world largest economy. That's quite a contribution. Most of that contribution depends on 90% of those areas being in good environmental condition, healthy ecosystems, yet 30 to 35% of those same ecosystems are critical marine habitats that have been overused or have been destroyed. Acidity is going up, oxygen is depleting, you know, not very good news. That's why we got together and got the sustainable goals, which is somehow uh, a framework to uh, try to develop some indicators that can be used for management and change direction of some of the things we do in the world. I'm going to focus on these three ones, the rest of the presentation, climate action, life below water and life on land. On the how, the, I will talk a little bit on the framework for artificial intelligence use. Um, why do we measure what matters? We, we do have a need for information by society to defining essential variables. We, can, we can't measure everything. We need to measure what's important, what is easy and what it's cheap to measure as well. And with that information, take decisions, the best decisions we can take. And those essential variables have been defined not without a lot of uh, uh, consensus uh, discussion, but there you are. Those are the essential climate variables, the one that feed the models that we normally cite and use to predict what's going to happen in 50 or 100 years time. But we also now have the essential ocean variables, which are those things that we do need to measure in order to have 
good uh, hydrodynamic models and understand what the waters in the seas do and where they go. But we also have the essential biodiversity variables, and those have been defined by some uh, um, a group of colleagues that have worked extensively on that. And when we go into the marine environment, the coastal environment, those are the important things that we need to measure. We focus on functional groups, microbes, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and so on, but also on the habitat state, uh, on those four habitat states. This is for purely oceanic and near coastal environments. Really, what we do is to simplify the work uh, and reduce costs through automation. Um, and therefore we need to design these frameworks and workflows to measure those essential ocean variables and those essential biodiversity variables. And on a nutshell, we need biodiversity time series, which species are where and when, we need common methods. Everybody should be measuring more or less the same thing uh, all over the place. And we need to lower the cost of technologies and be a little bit independent on humans uh, to make it uh, a little bit more cheaper and more rep uh, repeatable. Therefore, we need capacity development to develop these things and also give courses and make everybody to use this. And that's where the AI comes in. There's many different types of artificial intelligence, as you can see uh, there, it's been evolving. And now we have deep learning, some systems that can learn to learn to, to say uh, in some way. And to, to kind of dissect it down, AI for at least for biodiversity and ecological processes can work on images, can detect patterns, can detect the signals, things in the image, can also detect things in sounds the signals in sounds can be identified and matched, attached to some kind of biological entity, and also can be used on uh, identifying patterns in these uh, DNA sequences and attaching that to a particular species or process. And therefore, I'm going to uh, the what, the examples on today's applications, that's going to be the rest of my talk. I'm going to present you some uh, examples on coral reefs, on seahorse conservation we're trying to achieve here in Mexico, and also some fisheries related uh, AI products, and also some uh, of the work we're doing in the cenotes. So one of the first variables is eDNA, a technology that's being developing as, I, as we speak. Uh, it's basically capture what the animals leave behind uh, through automation uh, identification on algorithms that go through these deep sequences and just extract things. And this can be, uh, you know, free DNA, metabolic waste from the animals, damaged tissue, scales, things that the animals leave behind. That's very, very interesting. And the applications of the eDNA are being, are, are exploding. I mean, this, the, 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 the journals are just filled with the things that can be done on eDNA and the eDNA metabarcoding have a lot, many, many applications. And it's here where the artificial intelligence comes in and uh, correlates a, a particular sequence of DNA with a process or a species or an individual. And that's the potential. We need that to automate the system. We also been using more and more passive acoustics. This is one of the fields that is also exploding. It started with acoustics for the physical uh, environment. And now it's kind of adapting to the biological environment. As you can see here with this NOAA slide, uh, there's many ways of deploying the sensors that can collect uh, a lot of information, but it's processing the mathematical signals that these instruments capture wherever you put them and translate that into relevant information on which species are where or how many individuals of that species, how long they, they spend there. That's where the AI can learn and make this process automatic. We've been doing this for 10 or 15, 20 years. Now the quest is to automate this, to make it fully automatic. Another good example, a fantastic example actually, is the iNaturalist, which has been adopted here in Mexico as the Naturalista project held by Conabio. And this is just the citizen science that works really, really well. You just go on on a daily walk with your kids to the park, you take a picture with your phone, you share all that with the fellow uh, iNaturalists or naturalistas, uh, and then you discuss your findings and eventually identify the species. 
uh, the species can be identified by a, a colleague of yours, a specialist, but uh, through the registering of your observations through a photo, then you have an algorithm can help you identify the species and then you gather data. And that algorithm is amazingly uh, good and it's getting better every day. Every single time we upload a picture, that algorithm is getting better and better. This is, the, uh, I mean, I'm staggered by these numbers. This is the, the, um, the oh, sorry, it's in Spanish, I can't read this. Uh, it's the, the abstract of what's being done through 2019 last year. And look at the numbers. I mean, you have 13 million observations. You have more than nearly 170,000 species and 20 million identifications. So this is just the numbers for Mexico. And that's what it's going on uh, here. Um, and you can see that this can be translated into real useful information. Look at this example of Terrapina Carolina, una tortuja de caja. Uh, most of the identifications on the 12, uh, 2014 map above are from the GBIF web portal based on collections and specialist identifications. And look at the same numbers down on citizen sign. People just saw the, the, the turtle and took a picture. And now, look at the progression from 2014 to the, the, the year that's in the map, you have 16,000 si observations. El, el, el tuyo, ahorita que lo hablamos, que está, y se los mandamos de ejemplo. Okay, sí. ¿Sí? Yeah. Seguimos. Sorry. Arrancas, uh, lo mandas that, y lo conversamos. Sí. Okay, so uh, I see horse is another project mandado, based no, on sí. iNaturalist. And this, ya, ya lo, there's ya lo somebody, mutilé. could you mute your, yeah, thank you. So the High Sea Horse is another project that's based on the Naturalista, the iNaturalist platform, and it's basically focused on seahorses. So iNaturalist can be uh, adapted and focused on a particular project, a conservation project you have, and it's very simple. Just go into the beach, don't take your iPhone underwater, they are not submersible, but take a good underwater uh, photographic camera, take pictures of the seahorses, and what you end up with a map of the distribution of endangered species like the seahorses and this project, we've been supporting it through our laboratory here in Mexico, try to implement this uh, as a monitoring um, tool. You also have the flow cytoboat. boat. This is an adaptation of the old um, flow cytometer to count cells, but it's now uh, adapted to count algae, microalgae, the one that creates, you know, the, the uh, red uh, red tides and with lots of problems for public health. So this is the instrument that can be deployed and just be stationary or adapted to an underwater vehicle and you can do service with it. And based on size and hydrospectral um, information, uh, you can take pictures and now you have an algorithm that's learning what is what. You annotate this a little bit like in iNaturalist and suddenly the algorithm becomes more and more intelligent and knows at the different angles for a particular uh, algae. And with this kind of things, now we have this beautiful long, long-term series of information on a particular species or a community in whatever bay or uh, beach or harbor that you uh, want. So this is very a lot of potential, uh, a little bit uh, uh, expensive at the moment, but this will go on uh, and on. Another one is the coral net. This, just takes benthic images and analyzes it through deep neural networks. It allows fully semi-automatic annotation of images or uh, semi-automated or semi-automated and it also serves a repository for your data. So what you have here, CoralNet is kind of an evolution of coral point count for those that work on coral reefs, they, they will know what I'm speaking about. So basically now you upload your picture here and you annotate a couple of pictures and immediately the, the artificial intelligence algorithm learns what that is and starts uh, identifying things for you. We've been using this on some of the plates for monitoring of invasive species in Mexico and the algorithm after, I don't know, like two or three pictures was already on the 70% accuracy identification what an expert human eye is doing. So a very, very potent project. Look at the numbers on the right hand side of the slide. This thing is catching up and it's basic. it can be used kind of an orthogonal sampling on, on the image or you can do random sampling. Each of the, those numbers are uh, assigned. Yellow is, is not completely sure and you can tune that. You want it to be very sure or not that much. 
and the blue ones is where he's 100% sure that he knows what that is. So you can play with it. And after a while, you have uh, a machine learning uh, algorithm uh, identifying species for you. It's very good for sessile species. And here you have some examples of what we've been using that on our laboratory to identify some of the species we've been uh, deploying, uh, colonizing some uh, plates that we've been deploying in the field. Another very interesting example is this one using, uh, used by the Wild Book for whale sharks. So the whale sharks have like our fingerprints, they have a particular pattern like tigers and, and uh, uh, leopards and so on. And that pattern is unique to each individual. So by whatever picture you take, uh, they've been training this algorithm with the different views and angles. And this algorithm is getting ever better to identify individual whale sharks. Look at the numbers of this project. They already identified more than 12,000 uh, individual whale sharks and have been more than 75,000 um, reported sites and so on and so on. A lot of people is contributing to this and suddenly you going to swim with the whale sharks is not only just a touristic experience, then you can provide very useful information for conservation and management. And reaching to the end, uh, and going a little bit uh, inland now on the cenotes, you have the button bird monitoring. There's a lot of companies working on this. And uh, the particular example I have for you here is the wildlife acoustics, where you can buy this thing. I mean, it costs like four to fifty dollars. You put it on your iPhone or a, you need a high end uh, telephone to do this. And basically you translate your iPhone or whatever phone you have on a um, um, high frequency um, uh, well, not speaker microphone, and it's the processing of those high frequency uh, sounds emitted by the bats that can be uh, analyzed and processed through artificial intelligence. And automatically, with this thing, you just measure the thing, and automatically uh, the the system uh, tells you how many bats. Even if you don't see the bats, they will tell you how many uh, species there are. You need to calibrate a little bit. There's some errors still, but there's huge potential. And we've been applying for a scientific project grant on wildlife acoustics. Let's hope we get some of these fundings to monitor bats in the uh, touristic cenotes. Finally, to get to, to, to the end of my talk, the fisheries and boat monitoring can be used through this new a uh, new generation of uh, satellite constellations. Uh, one of them is being deployed by planet.org and they not only now the satellite passes through the same spot every day, now you have several satellites passing on the same spot every day. That means that you can have the pictures with the time difference of two to four hours on the same location. That starts enabling calculating the direction of some boats, you can extract metrics from uh, human uh, activities such, such as boats, and they have uh, algorithms that already identify what is a boat and what it's not a boat. And you can start using this for, I don't know, sport fisheries in Alacranes Reef or some oil spill or problems uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, more or less through real time. I'm showing you real vision images here, but the satellites have other sensors capable of other types of uh, products. And moving into the Global Fishing Watch, now you can use this type of remote sensing capacities to de develop these indicators on where are people fishing. So this is a map from 2016 on the global fishing effort. And you can see that whereas yellower, you will have more boats fishing and whereas black, you have less boats fishing or they are fishing without us knowing. So to finish my talk, I just you have like a 30 seconds video that I'm just going to play now. And what you can see here is this product from the Global Fishing Watch. And the, the dots that you are seeing is the, um, the, 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 the hours fishing on that particular date. And look at the times. I mean, this is today, this is the this year, 2020. And on the north of the Gulf of Mexico, you see a lot of things going on. And on the southern Gulf of Mexico, you hardly see anything going on. That doesn't mean that there's no fishing in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Of course there are, but our boats, our fleets are not equipped with these sensors that infiltrate the satellites or they're fishing at night without lights and we can spot them uh, or 
we start to need to apply this uh, new products to identify what the boat is. And if the boat doesn't have a signal transmitting instrument for us to track him down, well, we can photograph it down. And now we know who's going where. And it's a very potential tool. This thing is on the 22nd of November. So this is like four or five days ago. And with that, I think I presented you with a very brief and broad example of where AI is being used either globally on the biodiversity with a strong focus on the marine environment, but also with some examples of what we're doing in our laboratory in Yucatan. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Nuno. And I have a, I have a question for you. What do you think are the main challenges when implementing the technology? Because I know that we have talked, and during this forum, we have talked a lot about specifically how to um, involve the communities that are also part of this monitoring, involving the academic um, scientists and understand a little bit more how to interconnect with other associations, the government. But what are the main challenges that you see when implementing this technology and how can we mitigate them? So you have basically two main avenues. If you're going to use citizen science, the projects are already developed and what you need is uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, capacity building, communication, so people know that these tools exist and they can use it. And you, you need to be very creative on how to um, promote curiosity so people use them. Then you have the other more specialized instrumentation. And most of these things are still on the developing phase. So as, uh, as our colleagues were saying on the previous session, you need to develop good business uh, case scenarios and uh, business models that can monify that uh, the implementation of these monitoring devices. There's th that, that could be another topic for another, um, uh, how do you say, presentation. But I think that once some of these technologies mature and they start to develop uh, producing uh, linear and um, good results, then you will have a huge market to, to acquire these things. There's many ways um, we can force governments and peoples and companies to use these things. But at the moment, what, what I presented to you are projects that are, I don't know, like five, some of these things are 10 years old. They are very young. That's what I'm trying to, to see. Not sure that answers your question. It does, it does. Thank you very much. Um, I know you. that there is a, another comment in the chat about the description of a use case in Yucatan, uh, but I'm going to let you do that on chat because we're right on time to finish. So thank okay, you so thank much you so for much. your participation and we will continue with our program.